Welcome to the webinar, Renovating Buildings with Cost-Effective Reductions in Energy and Carbon Emissions, findings from IEA ABC Annex 56, hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency in collaboration with World Resources Institute and various partners. This webinar is organized under the umbrella of Building Efficiency Accelerator. We are pleased that 170 people have registered for this webinar, so everybody welcome. My name is Aristides Tsakiris and I'm a research assistant at Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. The center conducts research and advisory, uh, advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for sustainable, sustainable energy for all initiative. The center has an established network of global, regional and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. We also support Building Efficiency Accelerator with hosting different webinars from various partners. One more thing that I would like to mention is that we are recording this webinar and probably would be available on Basecamp. But on Copenhagen Center Knowledge Management Platform, we have many other webinars and resources on energy efficiency in buildings and other sector. So if you're interested, you are welcome to follow the link and find out more. I would like to hand over now to Isabel. Isabel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Aris, uh, for the support uh, for this uh, webinar, and thank you very much, Manuela, for organizing this interesting webinar and congratulations for the participation and of course uh, thank you very much to all of you for to participate in this uh, webinar so I will uh, I would like just to give you a short introduction on the uh, building efficiency accelerator let me check Okay, uh, the main goal of a uh, sustainable uh, energy for all is getting a, a sustainable uh, energy in uh, 2030 with three objectives. The first one is uh, to ensure universal access to uh, energy services. The second one is doubling the global rate of energy efficiency and the third one is doubling the share of renewable energies in the global uh, energy consumption. To do that, uh, okay, uh, the uh, Sustainable Energy for All Initiative has uh, launched a uh, uh, six uh, accelerator uh, platforms in the uh, main uh, sectors uh, uh, having a high impact on energy consumption, like lightning, uh, appliance and equipment, vehicle fuel efficiency, buildings, district energy and industry. At the moment we are talking about uh, building a uh, uh, accelerator uh, platform. So uh, the main uh, goal of this uh, of this uh, initiative is uh, to uh, get the commitment of subnational uh, entities. Uh, here you can see uh, some of the uh, of the uh, municipalities and uh, and uh, uh, subnational uh, governments that uh, have already joined this initiative together well this is the map of the jurisdictions we have at the moment in the initiative together with some ngos associations and multilateral uh, institutions 
institutions together with service providers and uh, companies. So um, it's a complementary mix of institutions, a, a worldwide place is uh, are included in in the uh, building efficiency accelerator. Why uh, building efficiency is so important? Well, uh, first of all, because uh, there is a large impact on buildings uh, in terms of uh, energy uh, consumption and CO2 emissions, because uh, buildings consume one third of the energy demand and are responsible for one quarter of CO2 emissions globally. But uh, uh, the good uh, news is that uh, the, the, there is a very large potential of improvement in terms of energy efficiency and renewable energies in this uh, sector. And that's why this is one of the target uh, sectors of uh, sustainable energy for our initiative. But also because uh, most of the uh, buildings uh, existing worldwide uh, have been uh, already uh, built, or at least they would last uh, for an average uh, for an average uh, age of uh, forty to uh, to one hundred uh, years. So uh, the improvements we perform in a building is uh, has a long lasting implication uh, as you can see we can have multiple benefits like economic benefits because the construction is a very important activity uh, uh, worldwide and also uh, social uh, in terms of job creation in terms of uh, of energy security in terms of uh, housing, etc., and uh, of course, environmental uh, benefits, as I mentioned. But uh, there is uh, a bridge to be built between the the needs of the stakeholders that are uh, dealing with uh, with uh, mostly with uh, housing and with uh, building uh, issues and the uh, requirements for energy efficiency in terms of policies, in terms of actions, in terms of technologies, in terms of regulations, etc. And that's why we have uh, identified uh, all these uh, seven, uh, sorry, eight actions uh, to, uh, to build uh, this bridge be, uh, between the demand of the stakeholders and the uh, overall uh, objective we would like to, to get at the end. So our commitment is double the rate of building energy efficiency in 2030 by uh, building a policies uh, implementation of demonstration projects and uh, tracking and uh, communication because communication of all these activities uh, and awareness is very important to get the, the final result. What we, we will do? Well, uh, in fact, we could uh, provide uh, some actions to prioritize the different processes and the different uh, actions that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the different municipalities and subnational uh, organisms uh, should uh, take for the uh, for the coming uh, years. Also, we could uh, provide the tools and the expertise and the solutions to get a uh, more energy efficiency buildings and uh, also we could uh, help uh, the municipalities and the subnational uh, governments to find uh, uh, the funding mechanisms 
to uh, improve the energy uh, efficiency at, uh, at the, the uh, cities. And uh, of course, uh, we offer some uh, collaboration with the VIA partners uh, in a, a multidisciplinary level. Okay, that's all. So uh, thank you uh, very much, and I give the floor to uh, Manuela. Let me check. Okay, thank you, Isabel. And I first uh, would like to welcome all the participants in this uh, webinar. I'm uh, Manuel Almeida from the University of Minho in Portugal and the coordinator of the project Cost Effective Energy and Carbon Emissions Optimization in Building Renovation. That it is a project promoted by the International Energy Agency under the EBC program, Energy in Buildings and Communities. And I would like to thank the opportunity to give the, uh, you an overview of the work carried out uh, within this project. Today, uh, from our team, uh, we will have uh, four presentations of about 15 minutes each, starting with me. Uh, with the general overview of the project, followed by my colleagues David Pinus and Ovmok, uh, that uh, with presentations dedicated to the case studies, and then going back to me uh, with the conclusions and recommendations that arose from this project. So, um, regarding the, the project, uh, I will try to give you a short overview of it. And the project started some time ago, in 2010, and uh, is closing uh, this year. We are just finishing the last documents related to the project. Twelve countries were initially involved uh, in the project although not all of them participated with the same effort. And it is relevant to note that uh, from the 12, 11 uh, uh, countries from Europe and 9 from European Union, which had a great impact on the definition of the objectives and on the progress of the, the work. Going back to 2010 and regarding the background of the project, we know that uh, in existing buildings, uh, the most cost-effective uh, renovation uh, uh, solutions are, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, of energy efficiency and carbon emission reduction measures. So we thought it was relevant to investigate where is the balance point between these two types of measures in a cost-benefit uh, perspective. So the question was how to achieve the best performance with minimal uh, effort. Uh, with this uh, in mind, um, uh, we, would, we set as main goals to develop a new uh, methodology uh, that could be used to support the development of the new regulations for a cost-optimal building renovation towards both the nearly zero energy and the nearly zero emissions objective. And also we would like to identify the optimal balance between the minimization of demand and generation of renewable energy measures in a cost-benefit perspective. So the questions were and are, how far is it possible to go with energy conservation 
uh, measures that initially are less expensive measures and from which point the carbon emission reduction measures become more economical. So um, we defined as specific uh, objectives to define a methodology for the establishment of cost optimized targets for energy and carbon emission reduction in building renovation. We would like to clarify the relationship between the emission and the energy targets and the eventual uh, hierarchy. To determine cost effective combinations of energy efficiency measures and carbon uh, emission reduction measures. And also, as a major goal of our project, to highlight the relevance of the co benefits achieved in the renovation process and find a way of integrating them in the decision making process regarding the selection of the renovation measures. It was uh, also important for us to collect exemplary case studies within the concept of the project to encourage decision makers to promote efficient and cost effective renovations as well as to validate the developed methodology. Also important was to characterize and understand the acceptance, motivation, needs, obstacles and drivers of the renovation process. And finally, it is uh, our intention to uh, develop or adapt tools to support the decision makers in accordance with the developed methodology, including the production of two renovation guidebooks for policy makers and professional home owners, and the delivery of some tools that allow applying the developed methodology. Regarding the scope, this project was mainly focused on residential buildings, both single family and multifamily buildings. But uh, we also dealt with a few non residential buildings, but without complex HVAC systems, and in order to prove the applicability of the developed methodology and the tools to other building categories. For instance, we have uh, analyzed a school in Czech Republic and an office building in Austria. For our project, we have selected three target groups and uh, we uh, intend to develop specific information for each one of uh, these groups. So, one major target group are the policy makers, but also decision makers like professional owners, investors, promoters, and also the, the technicians, architects, planners, consultants, and professionals from the construction uh, sector. In uh, what uh, concerns the methodology, that we developed, it is flexible enough to take into account uh, uh, country-specific uh, situations like uh, climate, uh, electricity mix, uh, conversion factors, national energy targets and so on. It also allows prioritizing either nearly zero emissions renovations or nearly zero emissions uh, or energy uh, renovations, each with an additional energy or emissions objective that has to be achieved at the same time. In any situation, there is a strong requirement to make sure that uh, uh, significant energy redux reductions must be achieved, whatever the priority chosen. And it also evaluates 
the life cycle impacts like embodied energy use and take into account as much as possible the co-benefits associated to the renovation process. To develop and support the methodology, we have done some, um, we followed, sorry, we followed the steps of the cost optimal methodology prescribed by the European Directive EPBD Recast that was supplemented by the Delegate Regulation from 2012. So, uh, following that uh, description, let's say, we have to start with uh, a reference scenario uh, that is uh, a renovation process without energy concerns. And for that scenario, we have to identify the global costs and the energy performance uh, of the building in terms of primary energy and also in terms of emissions. For the primary energy, we took into account uh, energy for heating, cooling, ventilation, lighting, building systems, built-in appliance whenever possible, and the embodied energy in the materials, but in this case only in the uh, materials added in the renovation process. Regarding costs, um, we considered a life cycle approach for a period of 13 years and we considered investment costs, energy costs, and maintenance costs in the 30 years. After this uh, reference uh, scenario, we have to define some alternative cost-effective renovation scenarios, improving the energy performance and reducing the global costs. We are moving left in this uh, graphic and doing this we obtain a curve with this typical shape where we can uh, identify the cost optimal solution, the cost optimal renovation scenario that it is the lowest point in this curve. That it is, uh, we have to say, that these cost-optimal solutions are now mandatory in the European Union. So, uh, within this project, we want to go beyond this cost-optimal level and we want to explore this region near the zero energy and near the zero emissions level. That it is uh, why we need to deeply analyze the co-benefits or additional benefits achieved in a renovation process in order to find arguments to push the renovation beyond the cost optimal level. So we tried to find a way of including these co-benefits in the decision making process. Regarding the co-benefits, meaning the benefits achieved besides energy emissions and costs reductions, like improving the overall quality of the building, improving users' well-being, economic benefits, and so on, we know that they are very hard to quantify, but we also know that they can increase the added value of the building and th disregarding them is the reason for the underestimation of the full value of the renovation works. So uh, this project is proposing a qualitative way 
of relating the energy renovation measures to the co-benefits that potentially result from the application of those measures. The owner's user's interests are considered by placing their willingness to pay for added co-benefits against the results from the life cycle costs assessment. So based on the project uh, case studies, a, mat a matrix like this one has been developed and tested in order to correlate the renovation measures with the positive or negative, because they can be both, they can be positive or they can be negative impacts of each renovation measure. And our idea is to integrate this matrix in the decision making process. Uh, to develop uh, and support the methodology, we have done some uh, simulations with data from eight European countries. Uh, to do that, to do these uh, simulations, these calculations, we have uh, generated some uh, reference buildings, as we call them, in each of the eight participating countries in this study. And these uh, uh, reference buildings, they uh, have the prevailing typologies and constructive solutions. We've also identified the different renovation solutions, including measures related to the envelope, systems, heating and cooling, uh, cooling only on the southern countries, and the integration of renewables. After, after that, after the definition of these uh, generic buildings, some parametric calculations have been performed and uh, finally the methodology was validated using the case studies we've been collecting and uh, where detailed information could be collected and we could only collect information from six out of the eight countries because we were asking for a lot of information that sometimes is difficult to get. Uh, the results of the simulations look like these ones. This is just an example for a single family house in Switzerland showing the impact of uh, energy efficiency measures on the envelope. We have here the different uh, renovation measures on the envelope. Um, the impact, so it is showing the impact of these measures on the energy, on the primary energy, and also on the emissions. And you can see we can get the curve similar to the one I show you um, before. So each mark corresponds to a renovation scenario. Also, just uh, as an example, we can see here uh, the impact of using different systems, using uh, renewable or non-renewable uh, sources. So you can see the impact in terms of primary energy or in terms of emissions of using uh, oil, oil heating, wood pallet heating, or geothermal heat pumps. So we did this for uh, 14 buildings from these eight countries, and the results allowed to raise some hypotheses, like the ones listed here, but I'm not going through them and allowed us also to come to some conclusions, like these ones, and that I will show you later in my second uh, intervention. 
And uh, these uh, conclusions and hypotheses were validated with data from uh, the real case studies that we have collected and that now my colleague David is going to show you uh, now. So I will give the floor to David now. Thank you, Manuela, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to welcome also all participants to the webinar. My name is David Venus. I'm an employee of AE Institute for Sustainable Technologies. Uh, we are situated in Gleisdorf in, in Austria, and we were leading subtask C in the IE EBC Annex 56 project on the detailed case studies. In the next minutes, I will present some results, conclusions, and lessons learned from the analysis of these detailed case studies. Today, I'm going to look at five points. First of all, I will show you what it means to be a detailed case study and which buildings we have analyzed in the Annex 56 project. After that, I will show you briefly the objectives of the analysis and the strategy to test the Annex 56 methodology. This will be followed by the investigated renovation packages and the results. And finally, I will draw some short conclusions and give an overview of the lessons learned. So, what are detailed case studies within the frame of the Annex 56 project? Detailed case studies are first of all residential and non-residential buildings. And most important, they serve as model projects for renovations in each of the individual countries. And the specific aim of the case study activity of the project was to provide significant and useful feedback from practice on a scientific basis. In total, six detailed case studies from six European countries have been gathered and analyzed. These countries are Austria, Czech Republic, Denmark, Portugal, Spain and Sweden. On the left side, you can see the map of Europe. Uh, where the locations of the six buildings are marked. It shows, it shows a, a good distribution over Europe. We have two buildings in the south, we have two buildings in Central Europe and two buildings in the north. This slide shows now some more information of the six detailed case studies, like the picture before and after the renovation, the building site and also the building type. Uh, you can also see the use of the construction, the use of the renovation, and also the, the cross-heated floor area. And the oldest of these buildings dates from 1953. The youngest was constructed in 1987. And the cross-heated floor areas of the buildings vary between 123 square meter and more than 9,900 square meters. The main object objectives of the analysis of the detailed case studies were, first of all, to test the developed methodology, then to reach an in-depth understanding of the performance of the selected case studies, to understand also the barriers and constraints for high performance renovations, to support decision makers and experts with profound science-based information for their future decisions, and also to show successful renovations in order to motivate decision makers and to stimulate the market towards more ambitious renovations. Now to test the methodology, uh, first of all different renovation measures and packages were defined. Uh, these measures and packages included different energy efficiency levels of the building envelope, different energy sources for heating and dom domestic hot water generation, different ventilation solutions, and also different forms of renewable energy generation on site. For the detailed case studies, each partner could define the char characteristics of the investigated renovation packages according to what is feasible in each country. And besides those renovation measures which lead to a reduction, 
of the energy demand of the building, also a reference case was defined, which includes only renovation measures which have to be carried out anyway. For example, like the repainting of the windows or of the outside walls, a roof ceiling, but also it could be also a minor insulation of the building envelope. In the next step, uh, parametric studies were performed uh, of these renovation packages. That means the life cycle costs, the carbon emissions, the primary energy um, demand of the buildings were calculated over the lifetime of the building. And additionally, also the co-benefits, which are related to those measures, were evaluated. And the third step included the analysis of the influence of the dif different renovation measures on the total results. And now I would like to show you um, some results of the analysis of the detailed case studies. I'd like to start with the calculation results of one case study, which is the case study Kapfenberg from Austria. And here I have um, plotted on the y-axis the life cycle costs and on the x-axis the carbon emissions. And the results are uh, referring to the situation where the building is equipped with an oil heating system. So we start with the reference case, which I said before is only including renovation measures that don't have an influence on the energy performance of the building. That means painting of the facade and the windows, roof ceiling and so on. In the next step, different renovation measures which improve the energy performance of the building were considered and the life cycle costs and the carbon emissions were calculated. So starting with the insulation of the exterior wall, uh, adding insulation of the roof, then including also a thermal installation system, uh, adding new windows, a new mechanical ventilation system, and finally also a PV system, a large PV system for the electricity production on site. So when we are looking at the results, we can see that in the case of this analysis, um, the renovation measures, the investigated renovation measures can reduce the carbon emissions compared to the reference case and also are um, cost effective, which means that the life cycle costs of the individual renovation measures are lower than the life cycle costs of the reference case. We can see that here, when, we see, when we're looking at the reference case, we can see that the carbon emissions of the reference case are about 65 kilogram CO2 equivalent per square meter in year, and by adding um, in, uh, renovation measures, uh, the carbon emissions can be reduced, and also that the life cycle costs are always lower than the life cycle cost of the reference case. So in fact, in this case, it would make sense to carry out all investigated renovation measures because as I said, they can reduce the carbon emissions and also have lower life cycle costs than the reference case. This slide now shows some overall results of the six detailed case studies. In this case, it, the, the carbon emissions reduction potentials are shown and the reduction potentials are shown as absolute values, uh, which are the uh, yellow columns, and as relative reduction potentials, which are the or orange uh, columns. And in this case, the investigated renovation measures and packages are compared to the individual reference cases. And the arrow indicates the range between the, the highest and lowest uh, reduction potentials. And when we are looking at the results, we can see that um, high reduction potentials are given, uh, with the highest reduction potential in Portugal, for example, where we can achieve a reduction of 92%, but also the other countries achieve uh, very good reduction potentials. What we also can see is that, for example, in the Czech Republic and also in the Swedish case, um, there is no minimum reduction given. That means, uh, depending on the initial situation and the investigated renovation measures, 
the, the investigated measures could also lead to an increase of the carbon emissions when compared to the reference case. That means there's no automatically uh, reduction given in these cases. The same uh, results or similar results um, we can see when we're looking at the total primary energy demand of the buildings. Uh, also here in these cases r high relative reductions are possible but also we can see again in the Czech and the, the Swedish case study that um, the investigated renovation measures don't lead automatically to a primary energy reduction. Here again uh, some renovation measures lead to an increase of the primary energy. So based on the analysis of the six detailed case studies which I briefly showed uh, now, it was possible to draw some conclusions and lessons learned and some of them are presented on the next two slides and more of them will be uh, available soon in the um, detailed case study report for example. So one of the conclusions was that we have seen that a switch to renewable energy sources reduces the carbon emissions more significantly than the energy efficiency measures on one or more envelope elements. So furthermore when the goal is to achieve high carbon emissions reductions it's more cost effective to switch to renewable energy sources and carry out less far-reaching renovations on the building envelope um, than to focus only on en energy efficiency measures alone. We've also seen that synergies can be achieved when a switch to renewable energy sources is combined with energy saving measures on the building envelope and we have seen that the calculations results which I've shown briefly uh, <clears throat> have shown that high carbon emissions and primary energy reductions are possible when um, where the corresponding renovation packages are also cost effective. However, we have also seen that not all investigated renovation measures bring a reduction of the carbon emissions, primary energy and or the life cycle costs Moreover, higher values compared to the reference case were calculated in some case studies. Um, we have also seen in the analysis that um, good examples for successful renovations are often missing and they are often the biggest barriers for renovation towards near zero energy and emissions. Um, the investigated detailed case studies are such good examples but we think that more are needed. This means that uh, national initi initiatives have to be launched to promote these kinds of building renovations and such initiatives could be for example financial support or funding programs via direct funding or via research projects and in our opinion also a further important step towards the cost-effective building renovations is the consideration of the whole building life cycle. That means the life cycle cost of the renovation packages should be regarded over the life cycle of the building and building elements. That um, further means that, um, that the investment costs should not be taken as the main decision criterion. Okay, I hope I could uh, give you a short view on the, on the results of the detailed case studies and I'm looking forward to your questions afterwards and now I will hand over to Ove. Thank you David. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I have to excuse for my voice. It's not as clear as it usually is, but I hope you will still be able to follow uh, what I'm telling you about the shining examples, sort of a, another type of case studies that we collected in uh, this Annex 56. This first slide might be a little overwhelming, for one thing, because of the title, and uh, secondly, because of all the authors. But I want to emphasize that um, we, it was really a, a group work, so all these authors, co-authors mentioned on this slide were really active uh, in the work with the shining examples uh, within this project. <coughs> um, 
we did this work with the objective to uh, uh, support decision makers with uh, information that they could use for their future decisions and to show successful renovation projects. I think David also mentioned that one of the barriers is, uh, for, for renovation, uh, deep energy renovation, is uh, that many good uh, uh, case studies is missing. And then we also wanted to understand the barriers and constraints for high performance renovation and to align uh, the methodology developed in Annex 56 that Manuela talked about before. The content of my short presentation here is uh, presented here. It's a presentation of where the shining examples were. And then I will go quickly through uh, the uh, sort of the templates that we used. We used the standard template for all the, the shining examples so we could collect sort of similar uh, information of all of them. And then I will give you an overview of three of the five analyses that we carried out on these shining examples because I only have this limited time. So if you want to dig into which measures were implement, implemented or which were sort of country climate specific, you have to get hold of the, of the shining examples uh, report or brochure, as we call it. And in the end, a few words about conclusions. So the uh, building, uh, where buildings were located uh, with a nice spread all over Europe, so you can see some in the south and some in the north and some in the middle. And the uh, distribution of types of buildings were 11 multifamily, 5 single family, 1 office, 1 school, a total of 18 buildings. This is the <coughs> presentation of this uh, template, as I mentioned before, we used. So for, on these six pages, we try to compile all the information that we could get on, on these shining examples. First, we wanted to look at the, the background for the renovation, the reasons why uh, these buildings were renovated. Often, it's, uh, it's the case that uh, buildings are not renovated because of energy uh, reasons, but because uh, there is some part of it are deteriorated or uh, they need to update the building to sort of present state uh, standard. So we had a look at that. We also got uh, an information about the site and the building the typology. And then we looked at the system before, the, the envelope, the heating uh, and so on systems. Before the energy renovation, had a, an understanding of the U values, etc. And then we moved on and looked at which are the energy renovations, or which were the energy renovations uh, features implemented in, in this particular shining examples. Here it was, as you see, high insulated windows, high level of opaque wall insulation, mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery, solar thermal panels and PV systems, and a heat pump. And uh, then we had uh, one page where we compared the, the savings, uh, the CO2 reductions, and the costs. So a quick overview, you could see how well this performed. And we have also some economical, a simple economical calculation. And <clears throat> we had an overall improvements. So the energy savings in this particular case were very high, 211 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Some improvements on in the indoor climate, the economics, the decision process, and the non-energy benefits that uh, uh, Manuela and David also talked about. And then finally, on the sixth page, a summary uh, of, of this particular shining examples. Then we moved on to the analysis carried out. Uh, we have uh, three that I'm going to dig into here. The any anyway measures, the barriers, which were the barriers and which were the solutions, and then some of the co-benefits observed by the authors of these particular uh, shining examples. So in, in our context, we defined anyway measures first as a set of actions, products, and services necessary to guarantee a regular, safe, and legal functioning of buildings, as well as aesthetics, technological, and contemporary evolutions that societal changes require them. That's a little sort of highbrow definition. What it says is, in simple words, what something that had to be done. And I think, uh, going back to uh, the 
presentations, also uh, as mentioned by, by Manuela and David, the reference case of their presentation. This is the reference case. This is what had to be done. And from there on, we could uh, implement the, uh, the energy saving measures. And it's also uh, a situation where some of these anyway measures uh, very directly influence the cost. If, for example, it's necessary to have an ex exterior painting or, or some repair on the external walls, for example, or changing your windows, then you will have to spend a lot of money on scaffolding. And when you have spent all that money on scaffolding, you will be able to uh, use much less money on external insulation, for example. And similar uh, considerations, if your heating systems, systems were in, near, in need of re repair, you might renew it and put in a heat pump instead of your old oil heating burner. And similar with the lighting levels and water and electricity networks. Next uh, thing we looked at was the barriers and solutions. And here I present to you uh, sort of a, a table where we have first shown uh, where at, at which uh, shining example, as for example, Kaffen, there are Trane Park uh, to the left. And then we mentioned uh, some of the barriers and uh, to the right, some of the solutions that we are the solutions to these uh, barriers. For example, if, if financing is a problem, then in this case, in Kaffenberg, they, they found other funding uh, solutions. They had a barrier because they needed uh, to resettle the residents. So they decided to run this uh, renovation in two construction phases, which, would, which made it more simple to uh, uh, have the residents moved uh, and, and live in other apartments while they were doing this renovation. Then there were practical administrative barriers, where which uh, took a lot of information uh, that they had further information had to be made. Uh, it could be difficult to get uh, approval from municipality, and then also again you had to make more detailed analysis and, and cost-benefit analysis to show that this really made, made sense. It could also be, and it often is, that the cost for this renovation is very high. And then uh, uh, you can only hope, <laughs> as, as mentioned here, that the building owner has understanding for uh, the sustainability and energy issues uh, that you are retrofitting. Um, so the, uh, the building owners, uh, did not always, that's similar, they did not, does not always understand uh, why uh, the costs are higher. And again, you have to give more and better information to the building owners about the, the, the benefits of and, and values of this project. So uh, we compared the, the barriers and solutions we found uh, by analyzing the shining examples with an earlier study we did at the very outset of the work back in I think uh, 2011, and at that study we we found sort of four types of, of barriers: information issues, technical issues, ownership issues, and economic issues. Uh, for the shining examples, it looked a little bit different. For seven, it was said no barriers. For seven, it was said administrative issues, and for six of them, it was economical financing financing issues. So what we learned from this uh, was that the general barriers were overcome for the shining examples. And, and we think that may be because they are forerunner projects and, and that these barriers were not really uh, in a barrier uh, keeping the project from being uh, carried out was in some cases or often due to persistence and endurance of a single person or a team. And uh, other uh, good solutions were finding uh, of additional uh, funding, introducing places. In some cases, the project manager had to be replaced. And also, maybe insert a person responsible for the energy part who really understands and can explain uh, the savings. So improve the information. And, and, and rather, and, and a use, useful thing was to look at the surroundings and find vacant buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, which could be used during the renovation phase. <clears throat> For the co-benefits of the non-energy benefits, uh, we in the 
in the whole annex uh, looked at 11, these 11 types of, of benefits, uh, co-benefits, where the first five, you can see that has to do with the indoor climate. Uh, number six is more like a, a technical uh, benefit. And then uh, the others are a little different in, in scope. Uh, but in, uh, in all these uh, 18 shining examples, we found uh, examples of these co-benefits uh, distributed or scattered. So for example, here in, uh, in Kapfenberg, we mentioned, uh, that I should explain the table. First, we have the place. Then we have co-benefits from energy-related measures. But as we also have uh, benefits from non-energy-related measures, we found it fair to include them in the, in the table. So, for example, uh, in this case, the non-energy related uh, measure uh, provides barrier-free access to uh, handicapped people, maybe, and uh, change layout of the flats that uh, could be, make the flats more useful. And on the other side, the energy related measures, we have improved thermal quality, better indoor climate, and this operational comfort, again, meaning that it's much easier to control the heating system, for example. Then the uh, next one, we had better thermal comfort, especially both in summer and in winter. We had improved acoustic comfort and a high ratio of daylight. Uh, I don't think I have to need, read through them all, but you see one of them, the, the co-benefit that uh, appears again and again is an improved indoor climate. And also another one uh, which is interesting is an improved architecture, so uh, people can tend to uh, enjoy uh, the, the, the house where they live uh, and maybe care more for it. Um, they, one further down, reduced exposure to energy prices uh, is of course uh, something that most people can appreciate that they are not sensitive to. Of course, in this case where the oil prices go down, <laughs> it would be maybe nice to see uh, uh, the influence of that, but that uh, has not been the case for many years. Uh, again, thermal and acoustic comfort, uh, and this uh, sign of pride, prestige, and reputation goes with the improved architecture. Then I come to the conclusions. What we learned is that a, a one size fits all approach is really unviable for cost effective uh, energy renovation. Uh, and also, the, these signing examples show that uh, the um, the, the implemented measures, rational use of energy or renewable energy supply uh, measures were a consequence of local op opportunities and constraints, ownership and uh, local laws, and not only a design option. And I think that is uh, an, a very important conclusion because when you start looking at a, at a new project or, and designing it, you think you can design everything just by making it a design optimal, but that's uh, often not the case. So again, I mentioned the shining examples, they are forerunners, it's initiated by first movers, and I think that's maybe still important to have first movers to get things happening uh, in Europe. Um, we think that the shining examples demonstrate the potential of the renovation measures. Uh, actually, we used the results in another study for the IEA where we showed the, the real potential of uh, energy savings in, and, and real sort of in real implemented uh, cases. And that was very useful for a, a new IEA report that uh, was issued uh, during this year. And I think <clears throat> at the end we can say the barriers were overcome and the renovations have led to many significant uh, co benefits. So, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I will uh, now uh, give the floor back to uh, Manuela. Okay, uh, thank you, Wolf. And now the last presentation, uh, it will be uh, with um, 
some uh, conclusions and uh, recommendations um, that we are preparing for our target groups that are mainly the policy makers and the professional homeowners. Um, uh, in the, at the end of, uh, of this project, we are at the end of it, it was very interesting to realize that uh, based on both the analyzed case studies and the simulations performed with the genetic buildings, we came to some common conclusions that are independent of the country, the location or the climate. So uh, it was very interesting to realize this, that we have some common problems. Um, and some of these conclusions are listed here. David has already pointed out some, uh, or the LS also has pointed out some of these conclusions. And these are some examples. For instance, the cost optimal uh, level does not lead to zero or even to the nearly uh, zero um, energy uh, level, energy or emissions level. Uh, it is essential to go a step further and explore the full potential of the cost-effective energy related renovation measures. Uh, another conclusion was that the optimal renovation scenario for the envelope hardly depends on the type of heating system used. It is usually uh, the same, whatever the system used. The improvement of the energy performance of buildings envelope within the building renovation process is essential to assure comfort and prevent pathologies. So it has to be always the first step. It is important to act on as many envelope elements as possible. The number of building elements renovated is much more important than the energy efficiency level of a single building element. And in the renovation process, the impact of embodied energy is low. These are just examples of some common conclusions that we came out of the, uh, our study. We have uh, also um, came to general conclusions related to standard setting and policy making, um, like, uh, like these ones. For instance, uh, higher relevance should be given to emission targets, uh, supplementing the energy targets. Higher relevance and incentives should be given to the replacement of heating systems. Synergies between renewable energy measures and energy efficiency measures should be encouraged and higher attention should be given to financial constraints and non-synchronism of renovation needs of the energy-related building. So step-by-step -step renovations should be uh, considered. So, based uh, on, uh, on these conclusions and other ones, we are at this moment finalizing some guidelines, two guidelines uh, with recommendations for policy makers and professional owners. And we are trying to develop specific uh, information using specific uh, messages or language for each one of the target groups. I'm going to show you some of these recommendations that are under preparation now, even at the risk of being tedious. So, for instance, this, uh, this one, uh, this uh, recommendation, new targets to reduce carbon emissions from buildings, from buildings should be set supplementing 
existing energy targets. And uh, then uh, the message uh, specific for policymakers could be something like this. It is advisable to introduce targets to reach nearly zero emissions, complementing the existing energy efficiency requirements. And the message for the building owners could be something like, in addition to carrying out energy efficiency improvements, it makes sense to consider reaching nearly zero emissions to make an important contribu contribution to protect the climate. Another one, another recommendation. Switch heating systems to renewable energy. So the message for policymakers, unless it is proven to be not cost effective, a switch to renewable energy should become mandatory when a heating system is replaced. And for building owners, the message could be when a heating system is replaced, a switch to renewable energy should always be evaluated. In many cases, it is even economically attractive. Another one, make use of synergies between renewable energy measures and energy efficiency measures. So for policymakers, the message, combination of energy efficiency measures with the change of the heating system should be promoted by policy actions through incentives and other policy measures. And for building owners, synergies are created when energy efficiency measures and the replacement of the heating system are carried out together. In this case, the investments in the building envelope result in savings on the investment costs for the heating system because the more energy efficient the building is, the smaller can be the heating system. Just another one, orientation towards cost effectiveness rather than cost optimality to achieve a sufficiently sustainable development of the building stock. So the message for policymakers can, can be cost optimal energy related renovation is near market based solutions and not ambitious enough to reach long term targets for existing buildings. And the message for the building owners the value of a building is increased by energy related building renovation. The maximization of the added value is achieved beyond cost optimal due to additional benefits beyond energy savings and costs. Just another one, just to give you an overview of the uh, type of recommendations we are preparing. So this recommendation, make use of opportunities when renovations are made anyway. So standards and incentive, incentives should focus on the opportunity within every anyway intervention on buildings and building elements. And for the building owners, every intervention on a building element is an opportunity to improve the energy performance of the building with a reduced extra cost. Take into account the complexity of building renovation in standards, targets, policies and strategies. So the message for the policy making is that existing buildings are complex and complexity requires flexible standards and targets instead of ready-made solutions to allow the search for the least cost path. And for the building owners, uh, each existing building is unique uh, their complexity and the significant investments require the development of specific strategies for maintenance, energy and emissions reductions. Regarding the co-benefits that we have talking about a lot today, consider the relevance of co-benefits from cost-effective energy and carbon emissions optimized building renovation. 
So for the policymakers, they should be aware that energy efficiency policies create impacts on several areas of the political action, like pollution, climate change, employment, economic growth, health, poor poverty, and so many others. And for building owners, the value of a building depends on the expectation of future reduced energy bills, but also on other benefits that increase the building quality and the user well-being. And just finally, uh, a good starting point for a major renovation is a good collaboration between all stakeholders, including the residents. Stakeholder roles should be made visible to increase understanding of their needs. So residents need to feel that they live in a home that have, has been improved and not impaired. But residents also need to have greater understanding of the housing company's interests and contractors and subcontractors' situation. An energy renovation should strengthen residents' perception on the building as uh, of uh, the building as home. So increased increased security, higher aesthetic values, improved indoor climate, actions perceived as deterioration example degraded indoor climate are difficult to gain acceptance uh, for. So these uh, are just some examples of the, the recommendations we are preparing for the guidebooks we are preparing for policymakers and for the professional home holders. Finally, I just would like to tell you that uh, we, you can find some information about us and about our uh, the results in our website. Uh, not much information is there yet. Uh, most of the, de the documents we are preparing are not yet uh, available, but uh, we hope that until the end of this year all of the documents uh, will be there. This is just uh, a list uh, of the publications um, that will be available. In green is what is uh, already in our website, available for everyone. So, but the documents we will put there is the methodology. We have already in our website a first version of this methodology. Uh, it will be replaced by another document um, later this year. Another document is related to the assessment of the impacts of energy related renovation uh, measures. Another uh, document uh, is related to the integration of life cycle analysis into the assessment of renovation measures. We also uh, we will have a document uh, regarding the co-benefits of energy-related building renovation, and uh, another document uh, with the tools and procedures to support decision making for cost-effective energy and carbon emissions optimization in building renovation. And we uh, will have also available some specific tools. This uh, ASCO, ASCO tool is already available in our website. It was one of the tools, uh, it is a Danish tool that already existed before, but it was adapted to the concept of uh, this project. We also have this A56 opt tool, that it is a tool with the, the methodology 
that we have developed. And the, this ECOSI tool, it is a Swiss tool related to the LCA analysis. Another document is related to the evaluation of the impact and relevance of different energy related renovation measures on the real case study that has been presented by David. Another one that it is a first version already available is the Shining Examples brochure. It will be updated uh, soon also. Another document related to owners and residents' acceptance of major energy renovation of buildings. And then that these are already finished. What is still missing, because we are still working on them, is these two renovation guidebooks. And in our website, you can also find some uh, uh, scientific papers, uh, 15 uh, papers that we have prepared last year. We have organized a special session in a conference, and uh, we have uh, prepared 15 papers that you can find them. Uh, in, the, in the website, and these papers tell the story of Annex 56. And so, thank you. That will be all from my side. And uh, I cannot, maybe it should be Alice now, but I cannot. Give you the floor, Iris. Yes, don't worry, Manuela. I'll take care of it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, now it's the Q and A session. We have a few questions from our attendees. Uh, Let's start with, with a question from Anna Marquez. Uh, it's a question to, uh, for David. And she's asking which measures consider increase the primary energy consumption? David, can you hear us? Yes, sorry. Um, um, I think the question is regarding the, the Czech and the, and the Swedish case studies where we have seen that um, the, the results not always shows a primary energy reduction but also an increase. And in, the, in this case, for example, in the Swedish case study, the, 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 the building is already equipped with um, um, district heating system which is based on mostly renewable energy and for example in our um, analysis we have also investigated other energy sources for heating and domestic hot water and therefore there could be also an increase of the primary energy because the already ex the, the, the reference case is already equipped with a re renewable energy system or source, and then the, the change to another um, energy source might increase the primary energy demand, for example. I hope I could uh, answer that question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, then we have another question for Manuela uh, for her first presentation, and the question is, have you plotted the primary energy versus the emissions for the optimum points of the different technologies? But can can you if I plotted the primary you, energy yeah primary, versus, yeah yeah for for different uh, renovation scenarios yes we, for for each of the renovation scenarios we have calculated the primary energy and also the emissions associated to each uh, renovation scenario yes. Okay. Uh, another question for Manuela. Uh, 
Have your studies been able to offer any qualification of co-benefits within a life cycle analysis framework to help strengthen the message that near, uh, nearly zero energy buildings means improved quality of life? Well, um, uh, in, a, in, in, in this project, the way we have found to take into consideration the co-benefits was the matrix I showed. Uh, and where we um, try to associate to each of the renovation measures a positive or a negative uh, impact. So, uh, and we want to put in this matrix the uh, willingness to pay of the users or the promoters, whatever we pay for the renovation. So it, we have to analyze measure by measure and each uh, user or the promoter has to uh, evaluate in his case if he's willing to pay for it. So it, it is not, there is not a, a rule or a, so we have organized the information with this matrix in order to facilitate the analysis of this potential benefits that can be either positive or negative. And we uh, look at them either uh, in a life cycle approach or so yes. I hope I have answered. Thank you, Manuela. Now we have another question, uh, I think it's for David. Uh, in your analysis of cost effectiveness, did you evaluate scenarios with a rise in carbon price over the lifetime of the efficiency improvements? Um, if I understand that right, I think this is not included in our uh, analysis. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, we have another question from Manuela for her, I think it's for, from her second presentation. Have your studies provided any guidance regarding circumstances where active renewable energy substances are more cost effective than energy efficiency measures and vice versa? Well, uh, our message is to as a, uh, is to first act or use whenever possible passive measures is the message is the first step to use passive measures if I understood correct the question so only uh, after that the active measures should be uh, considered but in many cases the active measures uh, for instance, I, I remember the photovoltaic panels, for instance. In many cases, it's not cost effective yet. So we have to analyze case by case. OK, thank you, Manuela. And uh, we have one last question for you, Emanuela, again, from Martin. Uh, and the question is, on long term, the total building stock has to be uh, carbon neutral and therefore both a combination of renewable energy subsidies and energy efficiency is needed. Implementing the cost optimal uh, approach of single measures could lead to tackling first the low hanging fruit, creating a lock in effect. What measures could be set in place to overcome this lock in effect for long term step by step renovations? from individual building perspective? I'm not sure if I understood, sorry, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but we have this, to, to balance this, uh, this, these types of measures, of course, uh, and it depends on our objectives. We, we want our final objectives to be carbon neutral, so the, the introduction of uh, Renewables in our buildings is, is a must and uh, we have to consider them uh, always in our analysis in, uh, when we 
are studying the, the, the options. So if you want to go to the carbon neutral uh, situation, renewables are indeed a, a must. If I understood correctly <laughs> the question. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Manuel, I think you're not going to mute your microphone because we have a, a response from Kevin. Uh, but Kevin says, but one of David's conclusion was that active measures can sometimes be more cost effective than passive measures. Yeah, yes, I told you I told you before that we have to analyze case by case. We have no uh, recipe, let's say. Uh, we have to apply this methodology, that's why we have, we have de developed this methodology, that, um, and we have to consider in each case which, which is best. We don't have uh, recipes. It happens that sometimes the active measures are more cost effective, for sure, but I uh, uh, state again that the passive measures should be the first step ever, because, for instance, they reduce the risk of pathologies, for instance, just for an example. Okay, thank you very much, Manuela. Uh, I think our time is uh, almost over. Uh, I would like to thank everybody, the attendees and uh, the panelists, for the webinar, and uh, I hope everybody uh, a nice week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>